Chapter 34, Multisystem Trauma. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe for future updates on all things EMS. Let's start off with just the general definition of multi-system trauma. A multi-trauma patient is one that has more than one serious injury, while a multi-system trauma patient has more than one injury that affects more than one body system. So we've got a patient who has multiple things going wrong at the same time. It's going to need good teamwork, good timing, making sure we make the right decisions at the right time, and a transport decision that's going to get that patient the care that they need the most. Trying to figure out the, what uh, to do with your patient. First, we're going to have to decide the priority severity. How bad are they? Do they need to get to the hospital now, or can they wait a few minutes? The second thing we're looking for is how to limit the scene time. Can I get off the scene within 10 minutes? Can I get off the scene within two minutes? So those are some decisions you're going to make, and we're going to talk about how to, how to prioritize what you do on scene versus what you do in route to the hospital. And then trying to decide which hospital you need to take the patient to. The most appropriate hospital, the closest hospital, the level two trauma center, the level one trauma center. And how are you going to get them there? By ambulance, by helicopter, by ambulance routine return or emergent return. So you've got some decisions to make here. And we're going to build on what we know from the previous patient scenarios to put them all together and come up with a good solution here. First, we're looking for uh, altered mental status. Anything less than uh, 14, so they can lose one point, actually two points, and be a critical patient. So they uh, that kind of points towards a head injury. Anything that's hypotension when you get to the scene, less than 90. If they've got to the point where their blood pressure is dropping, that's decompensated shock. Signs of internal bleeding, external bleeding. Anything that's causing the hypotension is critical enough there for us. Abnormal respiratory rates. If the respiratory rate isn't in the normal range, or it's not a normal pattern, it can signal the head injury, or the later states of shock when your body's losing the ability to control what uh, your respiratory rate does. Amputations. Proximal to the wrist or ankle. So anything above the wrist or ankle, we're going to consider a critical criteria. Pelvic fractures because of the force required to fracture a pelvis. Open or depressed skull fractures, all because the brain is kind of important for most people. And then any type of paralysis. Paralysis can be psychological, be physiological. We don't know until we get them to the hospital and have them fully evaluated. So we're going to treat them as a critical patient right away. Penetrating wounds to the core of the body. We're looking at the head, neck, torso, extremities proximal to the elbow or knee, the upper uh, extremities because of the large blood vessels and the large muscle mass there. Chest wall instability and deformity. We need to breathe. We need to have a functional chest wall, and this is why. Two or more proximal long bone fractures. The reason we have two or more as a high priority, priority is because of the force involved to cause those fractures. Crush, degloved, bangled, or pulseless extremity. All things that require a physician's assistance as soon as possible. If you do not have a physical problem, but the mechanism says this is serious enough, you're going to treat them as a critical patient. Any falls that are over three times their body height or 15 feet take into consideration what they landed on what well, body part hit the ground first high risk auto crashes if there's a major intrusion into the patient compartment talking six to twelve inches in intrusion into the patient compartment ejection from the vehicle if you were inside the vehicle and you got thrown outside, now you've increased your risk because of all the dangers involved outside the vehicle that you're not being protected from. If one person in the vehicle dies, everybody else in the car is considered critical 
until we prove otherwise. And then this is a new one that's starting to come up a lot, is vehicle telemetry data consistent with high-risk injury. If you have a vehicle with these sensors built into it, it will automatically call 911 when you have the crash, and it will give them the amount of force that you were subjected to. And they use a computer uh, algorithm to determine if you were critical or not. So you will get a dispatch and say the patient, uh, the vehicle crash was called in by OnStar. Your patient in the uh, Chevy Malibu suffered four Gs of force to the lateral left lateral side. And that will be enough for you to function to uh, make some decisions on. Special considerations. If your patient is over the age of 55, they don't compensate for shock well. So you may have to help them and get them to the hospital as soon as possible. Kiddos, because we have the ability to transport them to a pediatric specialty hospital, such as Children's Hospital, we choose that if it's the most appropriate option. Patients that are anticoagulants or pregnant get a high priority here, just because we're dealing with things we can't control in the ambulance. So managing our multi-system trauma patients. We've determined we've got one. Now what do we do? When do you recognize that it's a multi-system trauma patient? As soon as you get out of the ambulance, maybe even just with basic uh, dispatch information gives you a clue that there's going to be a multi-system trauma patient. Say you get dispatched to a construction site where a lineman working on a pole fell 30 feet to the ground. That gives you a clue that there's a multi-system trauma going on because you fell 30 feet. What body part was impacted helps you understand what to do next. Anything in the core tells you there's a critical patient. What's your first decision? It should involve ABCs. If you're keeping the patient alive, ABCs is where you start. What do you, ta uh, what do, you do to support the body system? Maintain the airway. How aggressive do you get with it? Do you... Uh, Secure the airway. Do you help with breathing? Do you stop the bleeding? Do you put a blanket on them to maintain the body warmth? Do you uh, call ALS to get them to do other interventions in the ABCs? And then you're going to have to make some decisions for your patient. What is most likely to keep them alive and get them to the hospital so we have a good outcome? When you have a patient that has critical injuries, you've got to make some decisions. Uh, primary assessment, you need to take care of them right away. Make sure they are breathing. Make sure the airway is secured. If you have to do an advanced airway, do an advanced airway. Don't delay transport. We say that patients have a golden hour to get to trauma care. We have the platinum 10 minutes that we want to get them off scene. One of the services I worked for if you were over 10 minutes on the scene on any patient, you had to document it in your narrative of your patient care report why it took you longer to get off scene. That made you think. That made you understand that you need to be getting off scene as quick as possible. But they also recognized that there were patients that sometimes you couldn't get off the scene as quick as possible. When you're setting up to take care of a multi-system trauma, try to figure out who does what. If you have two or three responders, one can take airway and breathing, one can take circulation, one can do a scene size up and get interviews with the patients and get things moving as quick as possible. Get them off the scene before uh, the patient becomes worse. And then our goal was to get them in surgery within one hour. Limit the scene, uh, scene treatment to these things. Stabilizing cervical spine. You do need to maintain the cervical spine, suction the airway, secure the airway, 
make sure it's patent, ventilate, give them oxygen, control bleeding, and stabilize the spine so we don't cause any more problems. Always remember that scene safety is a priority. Is the scene is not safe and you become injured or uh, something else happens to you, you cannot take care of your patient. So don't forget the airway. There are many patients that we focus just on the airway and we never get past that stage. So it's, it's important to make sure you maintain the airway. Urgent or emergency moves depends on what you need. And be adaptive. Do not assume you know everything and don't be afraid to say, this didn't work, let me try something different. That's why in class we ask you to do different ways to secure an airway, different ways to splint an injury. Pediatrics, now you've got a scared kid on top of being an injured kid, so you're going to have to work really hard to provide that emotional support to the patient and to the family and people around. It's, it's not a good thing to have a kid injured ever, and people get concerned about it. The other thing you got to consider is how important is the spinal motion restriction? Um, if the kid can't tell you what's going on, you're going to have to make that decision real quick. Err on the side of being cautious, but don't splint the child to death. Take the time to make the decision, make a good decision, and stick with your decision. Some systems we have a trauma scoring. It's a numerical rating for trauma. We base it on similar to the Glasgow Coma Scale, and that is part of it. So we're going to assign numbers to base to what we find in the patient. It gives you a good uh, objective observation you can pass on to the trauma center and helps them figure out what kind of care the patient needs. Some systems even include that into dispatch. So you provide a trauma score and they will help direct where you take the patients based on the availability. So know your system, know what's available, and use the tools you have. So it's called the revised trauma score. The first piece we're looking at is the Glasgow Coma Scale. So know that. If you're unfamiliar with it, there's a great song in my uh, supplemental uh, videos. I believe it's under section four or mod four. We're checking the systolic blood pressure and the respiratory rate. Again, with this scoring process, just like Glasgow Coma Scale by itself, that should be done quickly and without compromising patient care. So what you're going to do is put it into this format. A Glasgow Coma Scale of 13 to 15 gets a 4. 9 to 12 gets a 3. 6 to 8 gets a 2. 4 to 5 gets a 1. And 3 gets a 0. Remember, 3 being a, is the lowest you can get. Systolic blood pressure, 90 or above, gets a 4. 76 to 89 gets a 3. 50 to 75 gets a 2. 1 to 49 gets a 1. And no blood pressure or cardiac arrest gets a 0. Respiratory rate. 10 to 29, which is close to our normal range, they get a 4. If you're greater than 30, or 30 or greater, you get a 3. If you're too slow, the 6 to 9, you get a 2. 5 to 1, you get a 1, and 0 for 0. So use this trauma score to help you kind of gauge where your patient is. Trauma score 12 is good. Less than that, we're starting to think about what we might be doing with this patient. So as always, if you have questions, you have concerns, reach out to the instructor, bring your questions to the class, look them up and let us know what, you, what we can do to help you. Thanks and have a great night.